Okay, we are on page number 216, chapter number 20. Jatayu's death and cremating him made Ram forget his anger. Even the grief of Sita's disappearance mellowed when he saw the golden eagle had died for her sake. Ram grew quieter and more determined. Lakshman's terror subsided with his brother's brief madness, but he would never forget how fearsome his gentle Ram had been during the moments when he wanted to burn the earth. Lakshman heaved a sigh of relief. He had no doubt his brother could consume the world. They went south now, and a joyless journey they had without Sita. They missed her lively observations about this mighty tree and that tiny flower and the little deer with eyes too big for his face. She was not with them to make the jungle come alive with the miracle of her endless fascination. And the Dandak one was a one place, as forlorn as the princes themselves. Wrapped in gloom, they marched on. Though his tread was firmer now, not a word did Ram speak. Lakshman walked in silence at his side, his eyes alert for any further sign of Sita. They walked three kosas from Jansthan and came to the jungle called Tronch Aranya. This was a black forest with hardly a sunbeam breaking through the dense thatch of branches and leaves above. Often they saw glowing eyes staring at them from behind a great tree trunk or a black thicket as they went cautiously along. Their bows were fitted with arrows ready in their hands. Their progress was slow because they stumbled along mainly through pitch darkness. Frequently they sat on a convenient tree root or a smooth rock to rest. This was a dangerous jungle and they needed all their wits about them to pass safely through it. They went three kosas laboriously through the densest of ones while nameless creatures moved unseen through the thick undergrowth beside them and above them through the matted branches. Then they saw sunlight ahead and came out into the open. They stood in a clearing, shading their eyes from the glare until slowly their vision adjusted itself to the sun. They saw a cave before them and at its mouth stood a Rakshasi gazing at them with interest. In fact, she stared just at Lakshman. When she saw the princess, noticed her, she detached herself from the cave mouth and came ambling toward them with long strides. She was all smiles and fluttering eyelashes. Laying a hand on him enticingly, she said in her coarse, mannish voice to Lakshman, I am Ayomukhi. Come into my cave, fair stranger. I'm a mistress of love. Let us arrange the green jungle and the hill slopes of Cronch Aranya together, making love by daylight and darkness, moonlight and starlight. She stroked his cheek. She let her hand rove over his chest. With a cry of rage, Lakshman drew his sword and lopped off not just her nose and ears, but her heavy breasts as well. And she fled shrieking and gushing scarlet into her cave. They walked on into the jungle before them, forbidding as the one they had emerged from. They crept forward with Ayomukhi's howls ringing in their ears. Abruptly, Lakshman stopped in the dark. He whispered to Ram, my left side throbs and my mind is full of fear. Something evil lies in wait, not far ahead. A vantulak bird cried its thin, lilting cry, Ram touched his brother's arm. By the omen of the Vanchulak's call, we will overcome whatever it is. More carefully than ever, they crept along through the darkness. Ahead of them, the forest thinned and again some light shone through. They went gingerly toward the light. The feeling of threat was now a palpable thing. 
Then two enormous hands flashed out from the trees like lightning and seized them, dragged over leaves, scraping against tree trunks and branches, struggling but held firm. They were hauled a long way toward brightness and the strangest monster they had ever seen. He was uh, mountainous, but he had no head or legs, just a huge barrel of a trunk with these arms, nearly a yojan long, attached to it. A single gigantic eye was set in the middle of his hirsute body. Below it was a fanged maw. All around the rakshas were splashes of blood and bones picked them picked clean and the intestines and skins of creatures he had eaten. Among them deer and boar, elephant and tiger. The giant eye regarded them hungrily and the slavering mouth grinned. The creature's breath was fit to roar. He said in a thick lisp, Kabandh is lucky today. Long time since Kabandh had eaten human meat. He licked his lips and yawning his mouth wide, its stench unbearable, he brought his captives slowly toward it. He paused and manipulated his fingers, each one thick as a young tree, to loosen the deer skin and vulcal they wore. These he did not want to eat. Momentarily, the prince's arms were free. Quick as light, they drew their swords and hacked off Kabanda's hands at their wrists. His eye rolled in shock. His roars shook the jungle. Kabanda lived by hunting with his hands and his eye. For he had no legs, but life went out of him now with the gushers of blood from his severed wrists. His eyes streamed tears and through the rest of his screaming, he cried shrilly at them. Who are you humans? Who are you? The younger prince said, we are Ram and Lakshman. And who are you, awful one? A bitter laugh came from Kaband. He blinked his eyes several times in some deep remembrance. At last in a voice transformed, he said, it is my good fortune that brought you to me today. I think my long suffering is finally over. I was not always as ugly as you see me now, O Lakshman. Once my name was Dhanu, and I was as handsome as Som, and I was arrogant. I would frighten the rishis of the forest with my Maya. I would assume one monstrous form after another and roar at them from behind the trees. But one day I startled a hermit who had a quick temper and he cursed me. Be this monster from now. Since then I have been like this. I begged him to take back his curse. And he said, when Dashrath son Ram cuts off your hands and you die, you shall have your splendor back. I also offended Indra and he struck off my legs with his Vajra. Brahma said to me, live hunting with your arms, Dhanu. Cremate me, Ram. Release me from my bondage. Ram said, my wife Sita has been abducted by a Rakshas called Ravan. We only know his name. Do you know any more about him? You have been here for so long. You must know many things. Kaban said, dig a deep pit and cremate me in it. Then I will have my old powers back and know all things. Don't hesitate. Kshatriyas, your apparent cruelty shall be kindness. But without my hands, I will die anyway. And surely I beg you, hurry. Old memories already flood back into my mind, but I cannot see them clearly. The princes collected dry branches and twigs. They dug a pit deep enough to put Kabandh in and they burned him. The flames had scarcely begun to lick at the Rakshas when he was released from his curse. In a flash of light, a dazzling figure sprang up from that pit. Dhanu, the archer of the sky, Next moment, a chariot made of starlight and yoked to shining horses flew down to bear him away to Devlok. Radiant Dhanu said, Ram, I see all things again in both place and time. I will show you the way that leads to Sita. There is a prince of Vanars called Sugriv. He lives on Rishyamukh, the mountain that casts its shadow over the Pumpsaras. Pump your destiny and Sugreeves are bound together. You must find him. He is the son of Surya Dev, the ancestor of the Ikshvakus. 
he will be like a brother to you. He will ask for your help, but in return, he will do anything to help you, finds Sita. Like his father, the son, he knows everything that happens in the face of the earth. Swear an oath of friendship with him by a sacred fire, and he will certainly help you. Ram asked, how will I find Ampa? This path we are standing on, which Kamband once straddled, is lined with the trees whose sires grow in heaven. At its end, you will come to a garden not less beautiful than the Nandan or Chaitra. Beyond that garden is as pristine a lake as you will find in this world. The lotuses that grow in it were once brought down to the earth by the devas. The flowers of the pampa never fade, nor do its fruit rot. Its water is as clear as the heart of a rishi, and you can see down to the white sand on its bed. Swans and cranes and birds from unknown lands come to drink from it. The Pamsaras is so sacred, Ram, that it will restore your faith. By that lake, once the great Rishi Matang lived with his shishyas. In his ashram, you will still find an old woman called Shabri. A smile lit Dhanu's face, as I did when I was Kamband. She also waits for Vishnu's avatar. He left, but only to worship you, not devour you. She is so pure that she has been called a hundred times to Swarag. But she waits to see the face and the human form of Rama of Ayodhya. Impatient to be away among stars. <laughs> 